into our Bible study this evening, but before we do, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments, and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're thankful for your word. Thank you for all the provision we have here in time. And the fact that we are fabulously rich beyond compare because of your grace is overwhelming. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We read in our story last week how Joseph came up out of the dungeon and uh, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And I want to give a few points here in relation to the idea of Joseph's life, the different phases of his life before he came to power. And the first point is this, is that God is preparing you for the next stage in your life. As a young person, uh, this can be a little bit overwhelming um, because you have so much life ahead of you and you don't really know what to expect. And um, you should know that God is going to do everything He can to bring you to the place of maximum blessing. And in God's plan for your life, He's going to incorporate a lot of great times, a lot of great friends who love Bible doctrine, um, a lot of fellowship. and But He's also going to incorporate the right amount of heartbreak, the right amount of failed relationships, the right amount of pain, physical or mental, the right amount of suffering, the right amount of anguish, and all in just the right intensity at just the right time. He incorporates these things. And so you need to recognize when bad things happen in your life, it's not always bad. God's preparing you for the next phase in your life. And just remember that Joseph was the foreman of over his brothers in the ranch. And he was hated for it. And he was um, singled out and treated special by his father, and he got hated for that. And Joseph uh, got thrown in a, in a well and sold as a slave and falsely accused of sexual harassment and thrown in prison and forgotten about. And uh, all of these things that went on in, in Joseph's life were preparing him to be the second most powerful man in the world. And so when you're going through hardship in life and you're going through testing, you need to recognize to stay the course. Don't give up because God is preparing you for the next phase. Now, you may be at the end of your life and you say, well, I'm not going to be number two man in Egypt at this point. You know, I'm uh, this is beyond me. I'm, I'm, I'm old now. You know what God's preparing you for? And I, and I love the verse in Romans because it says, that the mature sons of God will be revealed. And you, you may question, why am I going through all of this hardship and pain and suffering and testing at this point in my life? I'm supposed to be having a good time. You don't, you don't fill your car up with super unleaded and then go trade it in. And it's the same way with God. He's not going to bring you home to heaven without you getting all the good out of all that doctrine you've got in your soul. 
and therefore he may you may feel like you're going through the ringer. Romans eight nineteen. For the earnest expectation, the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And that word sons is weos. And it means mature sons. So we don't know who they are right now is the point. But on that day we will know. They'll shine like the sun. And uh, they'll wear a new uniform. So no matter where you are in life, you need to recognize that God is working overtime bring you into the next phase and the next stage of your own life. Point two, there was never a good leader who hasn't experienced some injustices in life. Experienced some failed leadership. And Joseph certainly had his fair share the point is that he didn't he did not become sour grapes. And what you have to watch out for is the fact that in life you can be treated unfairly a lot, not just one time. You can go through multiple experiences of being treated unfairly. Don't let it turn you sour. Don't let it See, there's a lot of people who grumble and complain through life and they keep that attitude. That's all they think about is what am I going to gripe about and what am I going to complain about next? Sour grapes. And so injustices in life uh, push a lot of people into a sour mentality. Don't do that. You've got to be like Joseph. You've got to be an overcomer in your mind first in attitude And he certainly set an example because even when he got thrown in prison, he turned the whole prison around and was leading that whole operation. Then point three of review, Joseph is going to be in charge of showing compassion to those who are in famine. But you need to recognize that if Joseph was a spoiled rich kid and he had never needed compassion himself, he would not have made a good leader during a time of famine. But obviously, Joseph cried out for compassion when he was at the bottom of the well and he believed his brothers were going to leave him for dead. And I'm sure there were other times where he needed compassion. He was helpless in situations. And this is the kind of person who understands those who are in need. Now what's interesting is that the, his entity is going to own the food. The Egyptian government. But he is not going to give the food away. He is going to sell it. And so you need to recognize that Joseph understood compassion completely, but he doesn't give anything away. He is going to sell the food, and eventually they're going to end up trading him animals when they run out of money, and then they're going to trade him land. So he was compassionate in the fact that he kept them alive, but he didn't do it for free. And there's a very good point behind that. You can turn a whole generation into socialist slaves by giving away stuff. You teach them how not to work. We're in that stage right now in the United States of America. I, we can't even hire anybody. And uh, the workers that you do have, you can't chastise them. What if they quit? You can't hire anybody in their place. Nobody wants to go to work. So it's amazing the situation that happens when the government turns into Compassion International free stuff 
they ruin an entire generation. Joseph knew it. He didn't fall into that trap. Okay, we're going to stop right here. We're going to flip over. Oh, I want you to look at a verse. We, we covered it last week. In Genesis 41 in uh, 41 and 42, I want you to see it again. After Joseph interpreted the dream, and then he gave the application. He said you need to save up one-fifth of the product and for the first seven years, and then for the second seven years, we'll distribute it. And uh, he, the Pharaoh's response in verse 41, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Now, I want you to now turn over to Luke chapter 15. This has a, a very similar story here in, in Luke 15. And I didn't want to miss out on the chance to give you a brush up on it. Jesus is about to teach the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 11. Now the background for this was is that the religious Jews were complaining because Jesus had gone out to the corrupt, the tax collectors and the uh, vicious sinners and the prostitutes. And uh, he had took up uh, the helm with them because they were believing and they were sitting in Bible class and they were receiving his message. And uh, while some of these religious Jews were, were actually born again, they were mad at Jesus uh, for taking up with the uh, pirates, if you will. So he gives them the story of the prodigal son. He says, then he said, a certain man had two sons. Now the man is, is uh, God the Father, and these two sons are believers. And uh, you need to know the principle, once a son, always a son. So both of these sons were born again. So these are believers, they're both born again. You can't lose your salvation. And that is a uh, principle you need to remember during this story. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And the fact that we have been given escrow blessings, uncountable, and that we live in the state of blessing and grace as believers. And some of us will squander the grace that we have been given and some of us will use the grace that we have been given and uh, the fact that God the Father has given all of us logistical grace beyond compare and not only that spiritual provisions uh, for spiritual growth verse 13 and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And so this is the believer getting out of fellowship. He is going to entertain his sin nature. Now, we don't know what he did, actually. It just says riotous or prodigal living. Uh, we do know that uh, he was out of fellowship. See, at home here, represents the bottom circle and uh, the house does and uh, he leaves the house and so uh, we have a son who is carnal but God always has a plan in verse 14 but when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. 
I'm sure he had a lot of friends when he had money, and uh, they probably had a real good time. But when he ran out of money, they were gone. And here he is. He's uh, he doesn't have anybody that he knows, and he's in a faraway land. And the famine is divine discipline. God always has the right amount of discipline in, in store for you. And the idea is that it's supposed to drive you back home. Verse 15, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have glad, uh, verse 16, And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods, that's the locust beans that they were gathering to feed the hogs, that the swine ate. Uh, the, the idea is here that he would have eaten it, but the taskmaster would not let him even eat the hog feed. Uh, he, he was hungry, and, he, and the boss man says, No, you can't eat that. That's for the hogs. And uh, so he was continuing in hunger, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, and that's the point of divine discipline, is that you will come to yourself. Now, here's what's funny. I've got friends under divine discipline. Their life's falling apart. They've gone through every kind of bad life experience than you could imagine. And they, they're, they're a prodigal. They're born again. But they never came to their senses. And I try to tell them, you ought to get back to Bible class. And that's what Galatians tells us to do. It says, we ought to deliver them from the flames, but remember that we're not tempted. We, we, we need to be strong enough not to be tempted ourselves. And uh, so... We ought to be inviting our friends who are under divine discipline into Bible class where they get the answers for their spiritual life. Now, if they were here tonight and I was teaching the prodigal son, they would have an aha moment. I've been in famine. And here's the answer. But you know what? They never came to their senses and they're still in famine. And their life's going to continue to get worse. And that's why you will ha you'll suffer as a mature believer the, some of their pain because you see the intense suffering that they're doing and all you can do is be nice and say you ought to come to Bible class. That's all you can do. See, when you can never say, you can never accuse them of being under divine discipline because that's not our job. You just give them the application. You ought to get to Bible class. That's the application. So when well, he comes to himself in verse 17, and God is pouring on the pressure in the United States of America, and there are some people who are coming to themselves, but there are still a, quite a few who are still in a faraway land. And uh, they're not getting the point of the famine that we're in. And famine in uh, our day and time means economic depression and recession. And we are certainly in that. Inflation is at an all-time high. Your money is shrinking in your pocket. You're not making any more money, but it's costing you more to live. And uh, your house and your cars are wearing out, and you're not going to be able to replace them unless your pay goes up. And I don't know if you've recognized this or not, but God is pouring on the pressure in the United States of America, and they're still not coming to themselves. The famine is here. And at least the prodigal son was smart enough to know when, when he was in trouble. Now look, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to make a conclusion here that I'm in divine discipline and I'm supposed to do something. So let's see what happens. He says, when he came to himself, how many of my fathers, see he still considers himself a son, fathers hired servants, have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. See, I, I'd be way better off going back home. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Now here is rebound. And you need to recognize that 
While we, may, we confess our sins to God the Father in Jesus' name and we receive forgiveness and cleansing, we may also have to apologize to someone else who we have sinned against. And that's the idea here. Verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he says, you know, I see he... He's got a skeleton in his closet now. And the truth is, he should not have had this attitude because the, 1 John 1, 9 says, he, forgets, he forgives and cleanses. That means he takes away. And he can't even remember it. And so we ought not drag, drag the skeleton out of the closet and uh, worry over it and all of those things. And so here we have God the Father's response in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now this is what would happen to all of my friends who heard this story. They would be able to return to fellowship. They'd learn, hey, you need to confess your post-salvation sins and you need to return to fellowship right here in the bottom circle and that's where you can learn Bible doctrine and you need to go on the crash course. You're going to start getting on the right foot in life. And this is how God is going to treat you when He sees you in the driveway even though you stink like a hog. You see that? Verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to call your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Now what happened to Joseph when he became number two in the land? It's pretty close, isn't it? Real close. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead. That means he was temporarily dead, out of fellowship. There's seven different kinds of death in the Bible. When you're carnal, you are temporarily dead to God. He can't use you. He is alive again. That means he's returned to fellowship. He was lost. That, that word lost means in a state of ruin. And when you're in carnality and reversionism, you're in a state of ruin. And is found. That means my divine discipline drove him home. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and drew near to the house, the whole story is about the older son, by the way. And this is the son who is a self-righteous legalist. And he is, he is goody two-shoes. And he is going to look at his pigsty brother coming home, and he is going to look straight down his nose at him and be self-righteous and say, I'm holier than thou. But guess what? This whole story is about the other brother. And guess what? He was a worse sinner than the prodigal was. Older son was in the field, and when he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, What are these things? He said to him, Your brother has come, and because he's received him safe and sound, your father's killed the fatted calf. We're going to look at what these things mean here in a moment. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, I never transgress your commandment. And yes, he did. He was self-righteous at this very moment. At a time, and you never even gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours comes, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, now he's making some accusations. He doesn't know what happened. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. 
and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead, temporal death, and is alive again, and was lost in utter ruin, and is now found his home. So the older brother would not come into the house. The house was fellowship, the bottom circle. He was plagued with self-righteousness, legalism. And this was the religious Jew, the believing one, who was mad at Jesus for going unto the sinners. So what's the point? Whether you've been self-righteous and legalistic, you ought to confess that to God the Father in Jesus' name and receive forgiveness and cleansing and enter the house and make merry. Or whether you're a pirate and you've gone out and you've raised Cain and uh, done whatever, you ought to confess those sins to God the Father in Jesus' name, receive forgiveness and cleansing and go in the house. Both sides, see. Antinomianism or legalistic self-righteousness. Now this is the lesson that America needs to hear because we've got a lot of Christians who are play, they're playing God, they're playing church and they go sing and they uh, sing a chorus and they get three points in a poem and they're not receiving any information that'll help them out of the famine. We're living in a famine. And so here's the point. Now what I wanted you to see was the fact there were four things that the father gave the son on his return. Four characteristics of the restoration of fellowship. And if we look at the life of Joseph, we could, we could also use that story in a relationship. If you looked at Joseph's life and... Uh, he could be in a faraway land under all the discipline and time, and then when he receives the promotion, it's when he comes home and enters the bottom circle. So the father gave the prodigal son a robe when he returned. The best robe represents restoration to full experiential righteousness. His father did not make a servant out of him, Instead, he gave him the best robe. That is righteousness produced by the filling of the Holy Spirit. I like it because Paul even uses the phrase, but put on Christ. And the words for put on mean to put on a piece of clothing. And that's what experiential righteousness is. It's living the life of Christ. You're wearing His righteousness. Secondly, He gave him a ring. The signet ring is related to the Father's signature. You had that ring on, you could press it into wax, and it was a, it was a signature. In the ancient world, it was a form of identification. The restored prodigal was again identified experientially to the Father. With this ring, the son could draw on his father's tremendous account. It reminds us, by the way of analogy, that when we rebound, we're not only restored to our full status before God, experiential righteousness, number one, but at the same time, we have access to the father's unlimited divine operating assets. We can write a check on his account God is fabulously rich and He has shared His wealth with you. The treasures of Bible doctrine that He has bestowed upon us are amazing. You could study if you just made a job out of studying Bible doctrine and you studied eight hours a day and maybe took you a lunch break and slept at night and did a few other activities. You still would not, you'd still have to refresh yourself on different categories. It is an absolute treasure that God has left us in truth. And it's amazing how many believers carry around a thimble of truth. 
We have spent we, we spent months on three verses in Ephesians <coughs> just covering seven doctrines. I'm talking about a treasure trove of just doctrine, and that's not all of it. It gives you a lot more than that. The third thing he gave him was shoes. Now this was the only thing that Joseph didn't get. The shoes. The shoes represent, represent Christian service. Ephesians 6.15 When you rebound, confess your sins, you have the right and privilege to serve the Lord again. Now remember, the father said he was dead. And that means temporal death. When you're in carnality, you are temporally dead to God. He can't use you. When you return to fellowship, guess what? Now He can use you. Now God, the Holy Spirit, can lead, guide, and direct your life. And now you can learn some truth. And uh, you might even be able to be a stick. And any old stick will do. You might be able to be like Balaam's donkey and deliver a message. Filling of the Holy Spirit produces divine good. Do not let any legalistic believer flip your wings and quote the old cliche to you, the bird with the, the, bird with the broken pinion will never fly as high again. Why can you fly as high as before? Because you're back in fellowship. So keep moving. And Paul would say in Philippians, forgetting what was in the past and pressing forward. And if anybody can, Paul was a perfect example of somebody who could have a terrible skeleton in the closet because he killed Christians before he went into service. He could have a guilt complex that went a mile deep. And what did he say? I must forget it and move forward. And then fourthly, God the Father killed the fatted calf. The fatted calf, it wouldn't be pork since they were Jewish. And by the way, since the prodigal was out feeding swine, he was out, he, he, he disobeyed the Mosaic law, which said you don't even need to come near pork. And so he was defiled uh, by the law. But here, since the Jews, <clears throat> they were Jews, it speaks of fellowship in the word. Feeding on divine truth. And uh, you'll remember Revelation chapter 3, I think it's verse 12. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I'll come into him and sup with him. And so, the idea of fellowship around the table of God's word. And David would say, you prepare a table before... Uh, before me in the presence of my enemies. And these tables are where we sit and we eat with God. And it's the sweetest food that you could eat. It's a Bible doctrine. And some of your spiritual bodies need nourishment. And you need to sit down at the table. And have some fellowship. And feed on some doctrine. So you can receive some nourishment in your spiritual life. Now I wanted you to see those things because the story of Joseph is real close um, parallel. And I didn't want to skip the opportunity to touch up on the prodigal son. Now I'm going to flip back over to Genesis 41. By the way, the uh, prodigal son, there's a book, a publication. That's excellent. And that if you wanted to get some more detail on that story, you could read that. And uh, I even took these four points from the book, which is right here. Uh, You still see that, Jim? Um, you're on my PowerPoint, or okay, good. 
Okay, we're going to continue in the story now. Genesis 41. We saw in verse 44 that Joseph had been promoted. The idea is you're not promoted until God promotes you. And God promoted Joseph. In verse 45, the next part of the story, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zapneth Paania. And we need to, the, the meaning of that Egyptian name, it means interpreter of dreams, revealer of secrets, and even means sustainer of life. So it's an Egyptian word. It means interpreter of dreams, revealer of secrets, and sustainer of life. And he is going to sustain a lot of people in the famine. And he gave him a wife as a Sinath, a daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in cities. And he laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Now, the only way to store grain in this way is silos. And Joseph was the original silo builder if you will, and uh, the idea of storing that much grain had never come across anybody's mind, and here we have warehoused enough grain to survive seven years of famine, so it was a new technology to store that much food, and uh, obviously jo Joseph oversaw not only the building of these silos, but also uh, the filling of these silos. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea, and still he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. I'm sure people thought he was crazy. Why would you need to store up all this grain? It's going to go bad. We're not going to get to use it. It's too much. In seven years, they're going to be holding their hand out. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine who came from Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And <clears throat> there's a principle here that comes from Philippians 3.13. You can never have prosperity or blessing as a believer unless you forget. What Paul says, forgetting that which is behind. He called his firstborn Manasseh to demonstrate that all of his great prosperity that he has had at this point in time all came on the basis of the grace of God. He didn't try to avenge himself on anyone or try to hurt anyone. Now think about all the people he could have vengeance on. The first one was that cupbearer that forgot me for two years. Let's get him strung up. That little sucker. And let's think about uh, Potiphar. He didn't even want to hear my testimony and throw me in the slammer. And it was his old wife that got me in trouble. Let's get him strung up. 
And while we're at it, let's just search out my brothers and see if we can find them. No, see, he didn't have sour grapes. He had forgiven and forgotten. And that's what it takes to be great. The next son is Ephraim. And Ephraim means production. Production can only come in life of the believer by rebound and forgetting those things which are behind. And so now he's got some freedom. He's got the ability to use his mind and uh, do some great things. And so his second son, he names Manasseh, and that means he is going to get some stuff done. Now he's got his freedom. He's got some leadership skills. He knows how to work a crew. He ran the whole dungeon. And now he is going to prepare uh, the Middle East for a big crisis. There's another pr principle of grace here. And Manasseh, God made the difference. It wasn't who and what Joseph was. Remember, any of his brothers could be in the same position. There was nothing special about Joseph. And this tells us, you, your own thought life, will make or break your, you'll make or break yourself. Nobody else is controlling you. Nobody else is holding you back. Nobody's holding you down. You can do what you put your mind to. There is no disadvantages when it comes to this life. It's all riding on what you think. This is the principle of grace, the principle of stability, the principle of power, the blessing and inner happiness that came to Joseph and prepared him for the crisis. Remember that Joseph loved doctrine. And that's what propelled him to the front. Well, we've come to the uh, next section. I'm going to read the rest of the chapter here before we... Uh, we're not going to start verse 42 tonight. I want you to take a look at the rest of the Scripture here. In verse 53... Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended. And then we, we need to recognize how to enjoy prosperity while it exists. We live in a, we live in a, a system of prosperity that, which the world has never known. With modern medicines, air conditioning, shelter, modern nutrition... The world has never known the kind of prosperity that we are living in now. And we need to learn how to live and be, be happy in it. For it may not always last. And I think we can see the door closing. And there's always, uh, when, you're, when you're headed towards third world status, there's always a certain amount of suffering that comes with it. And we need, to, we need to recognize that, as in Joseph's story, we have been living in the seven years of prosperity, and we may well be headed into the seven years of famine. Verse 54, And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread. But when all the land of Egypt was famished, people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. Now, I want you to recognize, he didn't start handing out food immediately. He waited until they ran out of food, and they went through all their resources and trying to figure out a way to make it. And then when they came to the end of their rope, then he said, Okay, now we're going to start... The distribution. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses. That's silos. And sold to the Egyptians. He sold. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy 
grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Well, here's the principle once again. Your government ought to be run like a business and not Compassion International. And if people were trying to break across our borders uh, to come and pay out of their pocket for things, we wouldn't have near as much a problem. They're coming here for free stuff. The same thing that ruined their own country. Joseph knew that principle and he sold grain. He didn't give it away. And uh, it's amazing. At the end of World War II, our leadership recognized this. The economies of the rest of Europe and much of the world were broken. And the United States, we were sitting in great shape at the end of World War II because we were, we were away from all the bombing and all the other things. We had our industry. We had built the Industrial Revolution. It's sitting in our backyard and nobody's bombed it. And the rest of the factories and everything else of the world were broken. And we were sitting in the driver's seat. You know what we did? We said, okay, we see you need to rebuild your nation. So we are going to loan you money at this much interest to help you rebuild. And the banks in America got rich. We didn't give it away. We loaned it. And we helped them rebuild their economies and they paid us back. It was the principle of Joseph. If we could ever learn it again, we'd be sitting in the driver's seat. But no, they've got to try to talk about free stuff. Well, anyway, we've come to the end of chapter 41. And we've seen Joseph go all the way from the bottom of the well, the second in the land. And God is going to use this brilliant young man to not only deliver a lot of people from famine, but they're going to come to Egypt and they're going to learn about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this famine is going to drive the unbelievers of the world right there in front of Joseph where a Hebrew is going to be able to teach them about the God of the Jews, the God of the Bible. Well, we're going to stop right there. And we'll start the next chapter next week if the good Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. Well, thank you for your attention and attendance, especially those here in the building. It's a little warm.